All right, I'm live. <laughs> um, this is the first, we're kicking this off. Uh, my wife, she's, uh, she'll be here sh shortly. She's uh, went to go pick up her daughter. Um, but what we are looking to do is, um, we wanna start a, what we're gonna call um, Friday night with the plates, some of that effect. Um, so I'm starting this off tonight and these are just the uh, 30 minute or so um, Friday night sharing. It's not gonna necessarily be any sermons or uh, any um, formatted um, event. We are just gonna sit down, me and my wife, and we're gonna share. So tonight I'm gonna go ahead and share with you just um, my backstory, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Martin Flake, and uh, I was born and raised in the state of Utah. Um, loved it there. I loved my childhood. I had a wonderful childhood. Uh, um, when I was uh, three years old, my father committed suicide. Um, from he was as bad a case of paranoid schizophrenia. I mean, he was he was a, he was a very severe paranoid schizophrenic. Um, so when, at the age of three, uh, my father committed suicide. Now, I have uh, an older brother. I'm sorry, let me start. I have an, uh, an older sister who's the oldest. She's six years older than I am. I have an older brother that's four years older than me. And then I have a younger brother that's uh, about a year and a half, two years younger than me. Um, I was raised uh, Mormon. And I was raised from uh, a long heritage of Mormons from uh, both my mother and my father's side of the family. In fact, it goes back uh, five, six, seven generations. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's exactly six. But they, my fam both my side of my family go all the way back to um, the beginnings of Mormonism in, the, in uh, Nauvoo, Illinois. Uh, so I, I, uh, grew up and um, that's all I knew was um, going to church every Sunday with my mom and, and uh, um, her teaching us at home uh, about the gospel. Um, there, there's so much to my, to my um, childhood. I'm, I'm trying to keep my, my thoughts straight and keep it in, in line here. Um, I, as a young boy, uh, my mother raised all four of us um, on her own after my father passed away uh, until I was the age of 15. And from the time my father passed away to 15, um, I loved my childhood. I don't have any regrets about it. Yeah, my family was considered the wild family on our block. Um, being that my mother had to go to work and provide for us, left us at home to fend for ourselves. But that didn't sound like a bad thing. It was, it was, it was a, a wild and wonderful adventure. Uh, we got ourselves in a, a, our share of trouble, but we also learned responsibility very quickly. We learned how to stick together as, as a family and as brothers and sisters. Uh, my older brother, my older sister did a really well job of taking care of me and my younger brother uh, when my mother had to go to work. Um, so I look back at my childhood and, and people, you know, they, they get this idea that, yeah, my father committed suicide when I was three years old. How terrible could that have been? Um, you know, I, I, I really didn't know any different than being raised without a father. I didn't have a lot of memories of my dad. Um, and my younger brother didn't have any memories of, his, of, our, of our dad. So for us, you know, we, what you don't know, you don't know. And what you have never experienced, you don't miss. So my older brother and my older sister, uh, they would talk about it. And they, they, I think they struggled with it more than I did and more than my brother did. But we all did in, our, in different ways and different aspects. Well, we grew up in, and when I was 15, my mother uh, remarried and that didn't go so well. The man she remarried was, couldn't have been a better man. He was just an amazing man. Um, and I have the most respect 
the utmost respect for him today. Uh, but at the time, at 15 years old, uh, my mother introducing an authoritative figure when I, I was my own authority for the most part growing up. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, shortly after we married, we moved into to a, a new city and, uh, and it was difficult um, incorporating him into our life and he struggled with it, with it too because we, we weren't always the easiest and, and the nicest to him. Um, when I turned 19, like uh, so many Mormons do, I went and I, I became a missionary in South Korea again. It was something that, that I look back on with a lot of fondness and a lot of wonder because it was one of the best things that ever happened to me was being able to go to a foreign country and immerse myself into that, that culture. Uh, as well as of all the languages I had to learn, um, I was challenged with one of the most difficult languages that, that, that's considered to, to to be able to speak, um, but I loved it. I loved the language. I loved the people. I loved the food. In fact, to this day, I often we we still eat uh, kimchi. If you don't know what kimchi is, it's it's Korean sauerkraut for um, um, the best way to explain it. But we still eat kimchi here at my house. We still eat pot stickers, and we still eat. Um, I, 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 I love Korean ramen, so we still buy Korean ramen that you can buy. So if you ever want to know what real ramen tastes like, uh, go to your local store and see if you can find Sheen ramen. And now it's not going to be in the regular ramen section. It's going to be in the, the foreign foods. Uh, but it, it's, it, it's bright red and black packaging, and it's spicy. So if you don't like spicy, you don't like it. But if you like spicy, oof. <laughs> Now, ramen, American ramen is nasty, um, but Korean ramen is, is on a whole other level. It is, it is fantastic. And what other, what other, whatever other Korean foods I can get my hands on, I, I do uh, when I can, and I, I still love it. And I have dreams, or I have thoughts of maybe going back someday, but it's just not the same. You know, you go there, and you live among the people, and you become, it's like moving there, and uh, it's not just as a tourist, but as a part of, of society and of the culture. So going back would never be quite the same because it's one thing to live somewhere and it's another thing to visit somewhere. So someday I will, and, and you probably ask me, well, do you speak Korean? Sometimes, a little bit. Sometimes I, I dream in Korean still, but it, it, not very often anymore. I used to dream in Korean all the time, um, but not so much anymore. And I, I can still, for the most part, read and write, because um, it's a phonetic alphabet. It's not like Chinese or Japanese. It's, it's very phonetic. Um, but I do remember some things, and, and uh, one of the things I remember is, is a, a, a little um, child song, kind of like Wheels on the Bus or uh, Baby Shark. Well, there's a song about a mountain rabbit called Santoki in Korean that I taught my oldest son, and I've taught each one of my children, now my two-year-old daughter, um, we sing it all the time. So that's something that, that I guess I, I still retain from Korean. I still have all my Korean books, my Korean Bible, um, but it, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that it was an amazing event. It was a, a key event in my life, a, a moment in my life that stands out, um, but that was almost 30 years ago now. It's getting up there. It's been a long time ago. Uh, anyway, so I'm just going to continue to hit points on significant events in my life. Uh, so I returned uh, from Korea in uh, 94 and uh, quickly got married to my first wife, who I was married to for seven years. And we had uh, a son together, my oldest son, who is now 22. I still just blows my mind that I have a 22 year old son um, because my younger brother, in fact, no, my older brother and my younger brother are both grandpas. They both have grandchildren. Me and my, old, my sister, who's six years older than me, we still are not grandparents. 
I'm plenty old enough to be a grandparent. In fact, it's funny because most of my friends, uh, both now and growing up, are becoming in empty nesters. Um, I have a friend that I grew up with in Utah who about a year ago, maybe it's been two years, became an empty nester. And uh, I was in the process of having a, a baby newborn. So um, after seven years of uh, being married to my first wife, we, we divorced, um, which I told myself that I would never get married again until I got married to the right person. Um, I, was, I was dead set on not making the same mistake twice. So I was single for about 10 years. In fact, right, right exactly about 10 years until at that point, after 10 years of being single, um, I dated and, and was even engaged at one point. But after 10 years, uh, my son was pushing 16 and I was, I was, or he was 14 at the time, I'm sorry, he was 14. And I was thinking, you know what, I don't think I'm ever going to get married again. I'm, I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of chasing around. Um, I'm just going to settle down, become a bachelor with my son until he gets married, and then, you know, who knows. But I was dead set and just living alone for the rest of my life and having buddies and, and uh, having room, you know, being a roommate with my, with my oldest son. And, you know, it, it's funny. I remember my mother telling me, she was talking when, when uh, right before she remarried, how she gave up on getting married again. And bam, that's when she got remarried. And the same thing happened to my aunt. My aunt was divorced and uh, she was single and my mother was single for years together. Actually, we lived together and, and uh, um, then my aunt, she gave up on, actually it was both my mother and my aunt at the same time, they, they pretty much gave up on ever remarrying and they just settled on that they were gonna be roommates for the rest of their lives. And within one year, they were both married. So, <laughs> I, once I gave up on getting married, I was like, whatever, I'm done. I'm not, I'm tired of playing games. Um, I had been flirting back and forth a little bit at church with uh, a young lady. <clears throat> but I, uh, I was hesitant. I'm like, you know what? She's a lot younger than I. She's, I thought she was uh, a I thought she was just a young, fickle young lady. Um, and we, we bantered back and forth and talked and stuff and talked about going out and doing something. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so after about two years, two or three years of going to church together and just small talk in, in the hallways, she finally reaches out to me and says, so uh, when are we gonna go do something? And I, I wasn't at all, wanting any kind of relationship and uh so i was thinking hey yeah we'll go hang out we'll do some buddy things and just be you know a, a guy girl friend kind of thing um and <laughs> this would be my wife and uh the rest is history we went out on our first date and i spent the next few months backpedaling and and kicking and fighting the inevitable and the, the reality of, of who she was in my life. Um, and she oftentimes had to calm me down and just say, okay, let's just slow down. We'll slow it down. You're okay. You're not going to You're not going to fall apart. Um, but we knew very quickly that, that, um, this was it. And I knew very quickly that, that this woman that I was bantering back and forth, it, it's funny because that you know I, I had this idea because she would come to church all dolled up, looking cute, looking and always smiling and laughing and and uh, uh, carrying on with a lot of the younger members, and so I I, I was like, gosh, she, she's she's fickle and she's just a young girl and she's not what I not as mature as I would like a woman to be. But after going out on our first date, which wasn't really a date, we just went to go hang out. So we went, I don't remember, I think we uh, went out to eat. And then um, went for a motorcycle ride. 
because uh, that was me. I was in the motorcycles. And uh, um, so it was our first date, but it wasn't a date. But that night, oh, that's from, we went for a walk in the river. That's what we did. Shame on me. And uh, we went for a walk. Um, and within a few minutes, I mean, within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we got talking. And who I thought she was, was turned completely upside down. Um, and uh, realized that I was completely wrong at how, who she was. Um, that she was a lot more mature and a lot deeper person than I, than I gave her credit to be. And uh, so we quickly, we quickly got to know each other and we went through a, a fairly short courtship. It was three months. It was like three months. Um, but we were sure, we knew uh, that we were right for each other. And uh, coming from my background, was, we're a bit of an ironic couple because being that I was born and raised Mormons, and Mormons have the history that they do with um, African Americans or with Black people, um, I it was it was it was it was uh, it was never nobody ever expected it, let alone, you know least of all ourselves. But nobody, um, it, we just came out of left field. Our 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 relationship. Uh, but we are, me and Latuana are oh, so very different personality wise, the way we look at things, the way we process things. We are opposite sides of the skin. But where we, um, where we are similar is our devotion to God and our devotion to family and relationship. And so as awesome and different as we are, we um, could be more perfect for each other. At least I know that uh, she couldn't be more perfect for me. She is definitely the better of us two. She is um, the one that I, I definitely married up in our relationship because um, she is an amazing, amazing woman. She uh, has always inspired me. Um, always makes me want to be a better man, and she's always challenging me, which I, that's something I love about her is she, um, she never lets me get complacent with where I am in life, where, with where I am in my relationship with God. She's always challenging me, and uh, so her and I, we, we get married, and she was not born and raised in the Mormon church. We met in the Mormon church, but she was not born and raised in it. She had uh, joined the Mormon church um, about three years, three or four years prior uh, to us getting married. And um, we continued to be in the Mormon church for about a year after we got married. And then being who she is, she challenged me. She challenged me on my beliefs because in all honesty, when we got married, I was a bit of a spiritual wreck. I was really having a hard time. See, growing up in the Mormon church, I, I believed it with all my heart. I, I was sold to it. I couldn't imagine myself being anything else than Mormon. I, I was sure set that I was going to be a Mormon for the rest of my life, and you couldn't tell me otherwise. Uh, but by the time she met me, I was having some serious uh, doubts and concerns. There was just some things that um, I was seeing and I was witnessing that just weren't making sense. It just they weren't making sense. Um, so she challenged me. She started encouraging me to ask uh, those questions that I was struggling with to honestly ask um, about the things that I was, that I was really struggling with. And uh, one night we were, we were in bed and just talking 
And she challenged me. She says, look, as scary as it is, what if everything you were taught wasn't true? What if, um, what if you've been, what if it isn't true? And that scared me. It really scared me. So, um, I took some time and I really started thinking about it and questioning it and asking myself some hard questions. Um, and the result was that her and I both, we decided to uh, leave the Mormon church. So where do you go when you, you leave the only faith that you ever, you've ever believed, the only thing you've ever known, um, into a world that's chock full of different faiths and beliefs and doctrines and denominations. And it's not that I was ignorant of those denominations. I can say I was ignorant to a lot of their beliefs uh, as far as the finer points of, of their doctrines and beliefs. But in general, um, I understood mainstream Christianity. I understood uh, New Testament Christianity and it's because as Mormons, we read the New Testament, you know, we would read the New Testament too. So we were reading the same material. Um, so I understood the background and I understood uh, the general background of how uh, Catholicism um, and different factions broke off. And, and there was Martin Luther, there was John Calvin, there was the Church of England, there was um, the Baptist and, and the Presbyterian and so forth and so on. Uh, but once I leave Mormonism, it's like, okay, well, what now? So I took the, to me, it seemed like the only, the, the only logical thing is I started from the beginning. I told myself, okay, I'm going to pretend, or I'm going to do my best to, to um, approach the Bible from the beginning, from, from Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, um, as if I had never heard first of Mormonism and as if I had never heard of anything uh, heard from Christianity. That I, had, I, I began to read it as best as I could as if I was completely new to it. Like I had never read the Bible. I had never heard anything about Christianity or about Jesus and just see where it led me. See where um, the the dust settles. See where see where everything lays out. And uh, I'll tell you, it was the most amazing experience of my life, and it still is today. I'm still learning, and to some extent, I'm still deprogramming from from what I was raised with. Um, and so, you would think as as Christians that I was a sure fit to jump right into to Christianity, to traditional Christianity, um, if I had read the Bible that way, right? Well, not so much. Because not only did I start recognizing um, the discrepancies in what I was taught versus what I'm reading in the Bible, but also what traditional Christianity, some of their traditions that aren't in the Bible. Um, and so for, for about three years, uh, Latuan and I, we didn't go to any church. We went and visited a number of churches, and it varied from uh, charismatic to uh, Pentecostal to traditional Baptist to uh, Messianic, and nothing stuck, took, nothing stuck. And a lot of it had to do with I had, I had some serious hangups about uh, organized religions. I had come out of, I guess it was kind of a Paul experience, where I'd come out of um, a very top-heavy denomination, a very top-heavy religion where all authority is comes from the top of the church, from the leader of the church, the president, much like the Catholic church. Um, and so the last thing I wanted was denominational theology. I didn't want, because every denomination to some extent, has their traditions that um, aren't necessarily solidified in the Bible. They can, I understand how they can be 
interpreted that way, but it's it's their own take on different portions of the Bible, what it what what the Bible says. Now I'm not saying they're right or wrong, it's just it's their own it's their interpretation. And and I really struggled with that. Um, so one of the first things that, that Latuan and I really clung to or we really stuck to or we really came to a a belief and a testimony about was the seventh day Sabbath. Now <clears throat> that's not to say that that everybody that believes in the Sunday Sabbath is going to hell. That's not that's not our attitude at all. I mean both of us were born and raised um, in in Sunday Sabbath. We just believe or come to the belief after reading and studying that uh, the Sabbath is still the Sabbath. The Sabbath hasn't changed. The, the Sabbath is still the seventh day. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence to that. There's also a lot of, there is some argument and evidence um, to the Sunday Sabbath. And I understand that argument. But none of it, none of it was convincing enough. So we come to, we come to the understanding that, okay, the Sabbath is still the seventh day. So where do we go from there? That's when we went and we went and visited some messian messianics, and and it's almost like they were trying to be like the Jews. They were trying to follow the traditions of the Jews. Where, as I was reading through the, the, the Old Testament, I come to a decent understanding of what the Law of Moses and the Torah was. And we'd go to these messianic congregations, and they were practicing Jewish tradition that wasn't in the scriptures. And so we're like, well. We're, we're, that, that's not what we want. That's not that doesn't make sense. Um, and on the same sense, you know, we tried to go to Sunday churches, and and uh, in each denomination, they'd have their traditions that aren't necessarily in the Bible that we would, we just had a hard time with. And so finally, well, mostly me, but Tawana was just wanting a congregation to fellowship with me. I was the one that was having issues, and so finally. Latuana was begging me to find, she needed fellowship. Me, I'm, I've always been a loner, I've always been a bit of a hermit, and I can, I can be just happy by myself. But she really wanted to find a fellowship that we could, that we could really feel at home with. So uh, she, she asked me and she pleaded with me, and uh, I remember um, saying, okay, we'll find something. And, I was by myself, and I, I literally, I was kind of, I was praying, contemplating with God, and I just said, all right, God, I give up. I'll let go of my hangouts. You show me where you want me to be. I want to be a part of the congregation. I want to, I want to serve. I want to be about your work. I want to be the humble servant. My wife needs fellowship. I'm not going to judge. I'm not. You lead us to where you want us to go. And I let go of those hands. And within a week, we found uh, the strangest thing. I was just, I was looking for a set. One of the prerequisites for that we had was that it was a, we wanted a Sabbath keeping church, but we didn't want a Messianic church. Um, so I was just going through and looking for a Sabbath keeping church. And I come across Seventh Day Baptist. What? Seventh Day Baptist, not Seventh Day Adventist. It, it was to be very close, close because that's the first question I always get every time I mention Seventh Day Baptist. They say, someone says, Seventh Day Adventist? No, Seventh Day Baptist. They are a Baptist denomination. What? Well, actually one of the oldest Baptist denominations in the country, in the United States, um, but they believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath. And uh, so we went and visited, and immediately we felt at home. We felt welcomed, and we felt like, you know what? This is the place. And I still had my hang-ups. Don't, don't get me wrong. I was still inside struggling with, with going to a denomination, but every time I, I would, I would struggle with an issue, 
um, as we were attending the Seventh Day Baptist Church, um, these these hangups I would have, they weren't resolved so much as God would show me in ways that the hangups I had didn't matter. It's not that that, that the Seventh Day Baptist Church or denomination solved all my hangups and issues. I just God in his in his omnipotence in his wisdom showed me that each hang up I had didn't matter. It just there was there was of no significance. Um, so Latuan and I we we uh, we we joined the church as as official members of uh, the Seventh Day Baptist congregation and as I got to know people by going and visiting other people within the de denomination uh, just fell in love with the people the people are amazing people as well as they're extremely diverse I mean and I coming from somebody that was so had such hang-ups on denominations I often refer to the Seventh-day Baptist Church as the most non-denominational denomination because if you have a passion and a zeal for God if you believe that Jesus is the son of God and you believe that he died for you and that only through him will you uh, enter the kingdom of God that's all that matters. There are, there are so many different you know, uh, uh, just flavors and varieties of um, churches and congregations within the Seventh-day Baptist Church that you can't really say that, oh, Seventh-day Baptists are like this or like that. They're traditionally Baptist, don't get me wrong. They're very much traditionally Baptist. Um, really, the only difference is that they observe the Sabbath on the seventh day rather than on Sunday. Um, but within that, their, their beliefs and their theologies are so varied. Uh, and so it, I find it beautiful because in one of the ways that God showed me that my hang-ups have no significance, that they're just of no effect, um, was showing me that within this denomination there's room for me. There's room for my beliefs that I have begin to, began to form from reading the Bible um, like I've never heard the Bible before. Um, and uh, they welcome and they celebrate that. I lost my train of thought. So, <clears throat> so that's where we are now. Um, we have uh, Latoine and I, um, because the, the Seventh Day Baptist Church is is a very it's a relatively small denomination and it's very spread out. I mean, there's seven, Seventh Day Baptist denom uh, churches all over the United States, from the West Coast to the East Coast, from North to South. But there's but they're very spread out, and so it's not uncommon for um, people who are uh, who affiliate themselves with Seventh Day Baptist to live an hour, two hours, three hours away from the nearest congregation. Um, so we here uh, are about an hour away from the nearest congregation. And we have a, we have, Latoine and I have a passion and a desire to minister to our community uh, and to our surrounding areas. So we are uh, beginning to start our own ministry here, starting with our own town and in our area, which is, Primarily Orangeburg. Um, 
the Orangeburg, uh, Bamberg area. And uh, we would like to start an, uh, uh, just a, a ministry of service, a ministry of um, um, doing. It's not so much about gathering for church. It's not so much about gathering for Sabbath and doing the, the Sunday thing and the praising and the worship and go home and, and forget about church for, until the next week. We want to be a ministry of, of service. Uh, a, a scripture that, a verse that has really um, meant a lot to me in these last couple of years as I've been developing a new theology and a new understanding of the Bible is uh, James 1 27 um, in the King James uh, pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this to minister to the I'm paraphrasing it it's not perfect but it's pretty close to minister to the widows and to the fatherless and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I feel like I'm missing something there. But go read it, James 1, chapter 27, uh, or chapter 1, verse 27. But that is, that is the core of what we want to do in our ministry. We want to reach out. We want to take care of the poor, the widows, um, the fatherless. We want to... All we want to do is bring people closer to, to God. We're not, we don't want to build a church. We don't um, want to build, you know, a, a following. We want to raise up disciples. We want to um, minister to those around us and offer hope. So that's where we are now. I was expecting my wife to <laughs> come in and to show up, but she's obviously been delayed. Um, so that's me. That's who I am. Uh, that's what my focus is. And, and uh, I just have a knack for, for teaching. Um, and I have a knack for understanding. And so that's, that's where my strengths are. My, my beautiful wife which you'll meet next week, because next week will be her, her turn to introduce herself, is a, um, she is a very, very passionate woman, an amazingly passionate woman. She, um, she's an evangelist through and through. She's an evangelist. And so that's what she'll be bringing to the table and bringing into our ministry is her ability to stir the heart stir the heart into conviction and repentance um because when when she preaches and when she sings she just has a way of piercing into your heart and and just causing your heart to stir uh so uh, i'm i'm extremely blessed and favored man to have a wife like her and i'm, I'm excited for y'all to meet her and get to know her um, but, um, so being in Sabbath, because Sabbath keepers, seventh day Sabbath keepers, they generally recognize the, uh, the, the biblical day as it was laid out in, in Genesis that evening to evening is, uh, Sabbath. So, or evening to evening is day, sunset to sunset. So being that the sun is set and it's dark, uh, we are in the Sabbath. So I would wish every one of you a, a wonderful Sabbath and uh, going forward um, as much as we can on Friday nights we will be sitting down and just having a talk just talking about whatever comes to our hearts whatever we feel to share and maybe sharing some music which I always love because it's just such an amazing blessing to hear my wife sing um, and then on Sabbath Saturdays uh, three o'clock in the afternoons, we will be doing um, a Sabbath service that you can tune in live for, and then we'll be uploading these on Facebook and uh, on YouTube under uh, our new ministry name, which is 
fellowship of disciples. And uh, so until next time, until tomorrow, uh, I wish you all a wonderful Sabbath. Um, take some time this Sabbath and, and uh, just talk with God. Let him hear from you because that's, that's what he wants most. That's what he wants most is just a relationship with you. Um, have a wonderful evening and uh, have a wonderful Sabbath.